All right, now it's time. Again, like last week, I, you don't want to hear me preach. So I have called a good friend, and he, he, he should know me by now because every time I call, it's usually to ask him to preach because I try not to bother him otherwise. So anyways, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce you to Eldon Ellsbury. Uh, he's from Carroll area, and he's going to come up and uh, give us today's message. Oh, I, did, I, <laughs> I told him I'd hate to see the other guy, but anyways, no, blessings on you, bro. Love you, buddy. He's he's a he's a sweetheart, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, well, we'll get this out of the way right in front. I've had rotocuff surgery. I'm over the hurting stage for the most part. I'm in the danger zone now. I got to behave myself for another month before I get rid of this little pup, which is going to be fun to get rid of. But uh, we're doing fine and glad to be with you. I just want to say I, I am so thrilled with what's happening at Grace Baptist Church. Amen. Yeah, praise God. Amen. Uh, we spent just about 21 years in the Baptist Church in Carroll, a number of you know that. Uh, but it just thrills my heart to see what you're doing here. Uh, folks, if we love each other, and we'll love them outside the walls, we're going to see God bless His kingdom. Thank God for your pastor and family. God bless your brother. Never. Amen. I, I never met your pastor before this morning, but I have prayed for him because uh, we want to see God's kingdom advance everywhere. So right now I'm a retired preacher. I was tired yesterday, tired again today. Uh, I want to do something a little different this morning. Uh, normally I don't spend that much time in personal testimonies and that kind of thing. I usually spend my time all country on the word. And I'm gonna, we're going to do that. But uh, my wife and I had uh, experience of our lifetime uh, this past uh, January, February, March, and April. Uh, the last four or five years, we've been going to Texas since we retired from the church in Carroll. And doing building projects, we've met a lot of missionaries down in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and uh, we've been down there doing projects with missionaries and uh, pastors. We had plans. In fact, I've entitled my message this morning, Plans. Just simply that word, plans. We had plans to construct two buildings. One for Faith Christian Academy and where we attend church when we go to a Mission, Texas. And then for a second building for a missionary called Teddy Dehart, who has a tremendous ministry of gathering up stuff. I mean, when I say stuff, I mean you name it. Teddy has found it somewhere and take it into Mexico or somewhere down in the Southland to help pastors and missionaries who are spreading the word down in, in Mexico. So we had these plans. This is what we're going to do. Now, uh, do you like to make plans? Do you like it when your plans work? <laughs> How do you feel when they don't work? That's a lot of what we're going to be sharing with you here this morning. We had plans. This year, as you know, Christmas came on Sunday. And uh, we now live in, in uh, Central City. Uh, we have two married daughters and their families there, two grandsons living in Central City. Uh, actually, I think my first tear in his rotor cuff was from one of the daughters twisting my arm about moving to Central City. <laughs> I fought it for a number of We had a nice little acreage southwest of Carroll. We said, this is our last place. This is our retirement place and all. And then all the kids are gravitating over here, and we're getting all this pressure about, come join us. Well, uh, we, we gave in. And uh, the church there on Christmas Day, instead of having, uh, they were having two services. Uh, God is blessed. We're seeing tremendous growth there, just as you folk are. And uh, they're in the process of building a new building where we can get everybody into the building at once. And uh, God bless you and your plans. Don't be afraid to trust God. 
to do more than you can do. You know the church in Carroll? We couldn't do that. I had a couple people tell me that. Uh, Al Magnuson, whom you all know well, told me at our dedication, he told everybody at the dedication, when you folks set out to do this, I didn't think you could do it. But you thought you could, and you thought God wanted you to, so you did, and today we're dedicating the building. Uh, that is so true. Now, uh, we had a combined service on Christmas Eve, and Pastor Zeke, our senior pastor, said, I'm going to preach the same message tomorrow that I'm preaching here tonight. Because it being Christmas Day, family get together and all this stuff. So, we're planning to leave on Monday for South Texas. When that happened, we go home, and I'm all for leaving the snow to anybody who wants it. They can have all of mine. Why wait another day? We can leave Sunday morning. Don't normally travel on Sundays. I go to church on Sundays. Uh, so, okay, we'll go ahead and go. Now, sweet thing, that's my love, 54 years worth. She wasn't feeling good. We both had been fighting some cold stuff from what happens when you freeze your backside off in Nebraska in December and January. And I'm saying, you know, uh, I just don't know what's going on here, but well, let's go ahead and go. So we did. All day driving to Owasso, Oklahoma, which is right near Tulsa. Our third daughter, Beth, and her husband uh, live there and minister in a church there in Owasso. So we went to our daughter's Beth's, and we're going to spend the night, and then we would go on. Uh, all day long, she's not feeling well, having some pain. Not your typical heart pains that you have, so we found out. We got to Beth's, and Beth told us afterwards that I was scared to death when Mom walked up and knocked on the door, and I opened the door. She really wasn't feeling well. The next morning, we went to urgent care in Owasso to just, you know, see if we can get on top of this, what's going on. They put an EKG on her. It was a little off right to start with, and then everything was fine. They did all the other tests and checked, and I think, I think it's all right. What do we do? Do we go on? I asked him, I said, do we go to the local hospital and go further on this? He said, no, I think you're all right. If I was you, it's up to you, but I'd go ahead and go. So we had plans to go on, and we did. We traveled to Waco, Texas. You know where Waco, Texas is? What do you think about Waco, Texas? I had my opinions about Waco, Texas. have had them for a long time. I heard about the wacko from Waco a few years ago. <laughs> if you're into sports at all, what's going on with Baylor and their sports teams? You know, not good. My philosophy, my idea as I drive through Waco on our way down to the valley was, you know, this is kind of just an old rundown, dirty town. I didn't think much of Waco. My opinion changed today. We arrived at about 7 p.m. on Sunday evening, on Monday evening, ate supper and got a motel. Around 8.30, Geneva began to hurt worse. I got directions from the front desk as to where a hospital was, and we went to the hospital. She was admitted around midnight. December the 27th, many, many tests. It was determined she was having a heart attack or had, had a heart attack. It was determined that she had a three-way uh, artery bypass surgery, needed to, needed to have a three-way bypass. The only solution was open heart surgery. And how do you like those plans? I didn't want that. I didn't like that. Now, instead of being able to have surgery the next day, we had to wait uh, for five, six days, seven days, uh, because of blood thinner in her system and because of influenza that was found in her system. Eight days. Eight days after January 3rd, she underwent surgery. The doctor says, okay, you'll be in surgery 
uh, you'll be in intensive care for three or four days, usually four or five days in the hospital, then you usually have to do a little rehabbing. Nine days were spent in intensive care. On the evening of January 15th, two days after her surgery, she was given some medication that caused her to go code blue. Still have a little trouble with my emotions as I talk about these things. She was given this medication improperly and for three days and three nights we hung on to the Lord. Hun doesn't remember much of those three days and I'm glad she doesn't. After those nine days in intensive care, numerous challenges. Uh, she came out of surgery and what do you want after you get out of surgery? Give me a drink of water. She didn't have a drink of water for 39 days. They would take water and thicken it till it was like applesauce because of swallowing issues. The respirator had damaged her vocal cords from too many days with the breathing apparatus. But her lungs were having trouble. She had to have the respirator. On January 13th, she was finally moved from intensive care. Eight days later, on January the 20th, we were moved to an inpatient wing of the hospital for physical therapy. What hospital? Uh, Hillcrest Medical Center, Baylor Scott White. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Uh, I've known about Baylor medical thing for years. It's been a leader in heart things. Interesting, wasn't it, that it's in Waco, Texas. Two weeks in, in uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, dealing with swallowing issues, numerous things and all kinds of good stuff. I won't even bury you with all that. On February the 3rd, we were dismissed from the inpatient rehab, 39 days after we'd walked into the Hillcrest Medical Center. We were able to travel back to Owasso, that day, rested for two days with our daughter, and then took two more days to get from a wash home to get home. Jeremiah 29, 11, we all probably know. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Chapter 29 of Jeremiah is a letter to the exiles. The people were, going, were captives in Babylon. And Jeremiah says, hey, cheer up, folks. God's got good plans for us. Seventy years from now, he's going to get us out of here. <laughs> Some plans, huh? Now note the personal pronouns in that verse. I, for I know the plans I have for you. You see, you and I want to make our plans. We want to do it our way. We want to do it when we want to. We don't want to do it till we're ready. One of the things, we got four grown daughters today. One of the things I did with the girls was when I told them something, I expected them to respond. Not when they felt like it. I love explicit obedience. I've tried to apply it to my life when it comes to dealing with the Lord. There are times I don't understand God's plans. There are times I don't know God's plans. There's times I have my plans. There's a song. I got to look up this song. Maybe you let me know who it is. But there's a phrase in it that just, I just love it. When you don't see his plan, when you don't understand, trust his heart. I love that. That's a lot of what God was teaching us through that whole ordeal in Waco, Texas. So the next time you have trouble with the plans, God's plans, I want to ask you to think about three things. 
Who is omniscient? Omniscient means all-knowing. Who is all-omnipotent? Who is omnipotent? All-powerful. Who is omnipresent? Everywhere present. That's God. That's what God is. God is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is everywhere present. God is everywhere, in everything, and able for everything. Had to kind of relearn that a little bit during those 39 days. In Revelation 1.8 says, I am Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. There are some interesting things that take place in 1 Samuel 16. If you want to open your Bibles there, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there because I want to get to the 23rd Psalm and I want to draw some things together from our thoughts this morning. But in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, God has a plan. And it's a plan for the next king of Israel, uh, his chosen people. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel, fill your horn of oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. End of quote. God has a plan. Now, do you think God knows better what's for you, what you need than you know for yourself what you think you need? Human nature really gets in the way here. God knows best. Did I want to stop in Waco? No way. I'm looking forward to, God willing, going through Waco next year and spend one night there and going on down to the valley. All right? But God had a plan. He dropped us in Waco, Texas, the home of the most... Uh, one of, if not the most, heart-specializing medical centers in the state of Texas. And Texas is a big place. Um, God knew that the doctor that needed to do our surgery was going on vacation in eight days after we got there. He did our surgery on the seventh day before he left the next day. God knew that there were going to be some traumatic outcomes from this time in the hospital. And step by step by step, he provided for those. In Samuel verses two, uh, 16, 2 through 11, Samuel checks out Jesse's sons. In verse 7, we have these words, quote, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. That's Elib, the oldest son. The Lord does not look at things at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Boy, folks, get the message. Get the message. God wants to know what's in your heart. That's what matters. You know, fat, skinny, thin, whatever, you know, that don't mean nothing. What's in the heart? God looks at the heart. He knew David's heart. He said, this is the guy I can use. Here's a guy who turned out being known as a man after God's own heart. The only one that ever says anything about that in the Bible. The only one, David. God says, I want him. Seven sons were brought before Samuel the prophet. God said no to all of them. God has a plan. Are there any other sons, Samuel asks. In verse 11, quote, There is one, but he is tending sheep. Now what do you know about the shepherd? Do you know that if there was a trial and a shepherd was a witness, they wouldn't receive his witness? They were that low on the the cultural plane of their lives wouldn't even receive their testimony you can't trust them they're a bunch of thieves you know and those. shepherd 
his job, the youngest of the bunch got stuck with taking care of this sheep. Now we know about sheep. Fascinating study. I just discovered recently that Philip Keller, he wrote three books. He was a lifelong shepherd, an author, and he's written three books. The Shepherd Looks at the Good Shepherd, The Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and The Shepherd Something Else. They now have them in a trilogy. You can get that one book. It's got all three of them. It's well worth your time. It's worth your reading because he, he knows what it's like to deal with sheep. It makes all the correlation between how sheep operate, how the shepherd operates the sheep, and how God by his spirit wants to work through you and I. This shepherd boy became anointed king. He was just a kid. Young people, are you listening? God don't make no junk. He's made every one of us. He wants to use every one of us. He made you up front where everybody sees you. He may be where nobody sees you. It don't make no difference. Do what God has called you to do. David was God's choice and became Israel's greatest king. Well, that shepherd boy was used to write the 23rd Psalm. Now, I want us to go to that 23rd Psalm. So if you would open your Bibles to that point, we're going to walk down through this, and I'm going to tie together uh, some of these thoughts in regard to our testimony and, and the, the psalm here. 23rd Psalm, the Lord. Uh-oh. Who's in charge when you say the Lord? That me? That you? No. The Lord. Um, Unger's Bible Dictionary says, uh, check out what they had to say about lordship on that. It said, quote, an early word denoting ownership, semicolon, absolute control. End of quote. Now, does that give you and I room to tell you what we're going to do? Now, God doesn't want us to throw our minds away and, you know, and all this, but we got to know who, who the Lord is. He's Lord. In the middle of the night, my wife not even knowing what's going on around her. God was there. When the doctor shook their head, said, I don't know. God was there. After those three days of the worst three days of those 39, I followed the doctor out in the hall. Doctor, give it to me straight. What's going on? He said, I think she's going to make it. Where's God? He's right there. When there's nothing else to hang on to, God was there. He was there. We cried, we prayed, but we hung on to God. And she's sitting out there this morning. The Lord, I could, you preach a whole series on this, Pastor Daniel. The Lordship, God's Lordship. The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, folks, I hope he's your shepherd. Because you may get the surprise of your life like we did in the months of January, February, and March of this year. But he's there. He was there. He was there all along, waiting patiently. The Lord is my shepherd. He is Jehovah, God complete the doctor that did the surgeon at Geneva was not a Christian but I told him a whole lot about the Lord and he couldn't argue the fact she's still alive because I don't think he thought she was going to make it uh, sheep are completely dependent on the shepherd for a lot of things. Well, pretty much everything would have come down to it. 
Number one, what about provision? How did God provide for us? In his plan, he had us leave a day earlier, so when the heart attack happened, we're in Waco. We wasn't go I wasn't going to stop in Waco. I was going to go on down the road a little further that day. I decided, oh, we'll go ahead and spend the night in Waco, a mile and a half from this hospital. God knew that. That was all part of his plan. He had us exactly where we needed to be. Wanted? No. No. That wasn't my, I didn't want to, that wasn't what I wanted. That's where I needed to be. So I turned a new page in my book on trusting the sovereignty of God. God knows. He loves us. Secondly, guidance. I was not planning on being that close to the hospital that night. Protection. We walked in the emergency room. She's having a heart attack. Everything we needed, God provided. Now, how many think it'd be fun to travel somewhere? You get 500, 600 miles from home and 400 miles from where you're going, and you decide you're going to spend 39 days there. Uh, they would let me stay in a room with Hunt, but I couldn't shower in, uh, in the room. So I had to get a motel room. Now, motel rooms on the road is not an uh, ideal thing. Uh, didn't plan for that. But the day before, two days before surgery, a friend from Carol called me and said, how Geneva? I said, well, we know she's got these bypass surgery, artery problems, and going to be doing this. And they've scheduled surgery for uh, the third and he says, well, what about yourself? Uh, you got your, you, you taken care of, you got, where are you staying? I said, well, I've been staying with her at the hospital. A good place not to get any sleep. I'm staying with her, but I said, I'm going to have to find something else. And I said, that's got to check that out later today. And he said, well, don't do anything yet. I want to do some checking. He called me back a couple hours later or so, hour and a half later, and says, uh, I've got you a motel room, and I've paid for the first 10 days. I'm a retired preacher. I can't afford to just go anywhere when I want to and uh, stay in the motels. Uh, it turned out that this brother has a business where he travels a lot, and he found out the surgery date. He showed up the day before surgery and said, I'm going to hang with you. When Janine was out of recovery, he hugged me goodbye. He said, I paid for another 10 days. John 10, 11 calls Jesus the good shepherd. Hebrews 13, 20 calls Jesus the great shepherd. 1 Peter 5, 4 calls Jesus the chief shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now this psalm does not focus on animal-like qualities of sheep, but it focuses on the discipline, excuse me, the, yeah, the discipline qualities of those who follow. Good sheep rest in the shepherd. It's hard to rest when we go through these hard things, isn't it? Uh, we got better at it as time went on. We started every morning. We would just pray and we'd ask for two things. God, give us grace. God, give us strength to deal with whatever we come the way. Verses 2 and 3 of Psalms 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I can sum that up in one word. Contentment. Contentment. You can rest in the Lord. Well, it doesn't mean I don't have to trust tomorrow. It don't mean there might be another curveball coming when I'm looking for a fastball. But I can trust the Lord and be contented. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. 
Our shepherd knows about the green pastures. He knows about the quiet waters. For 32 days, I never thought I would see anyone not be able to have a glass of water when they wanted it. I love water. I'm a water drinker. And uh, that, was, that was a long, hard thing. And he's able to restore us. The only leftover my love has from all that she went through is she still don't have the vocal cords working 100%. Uh, praise God, she got way more voice today than she had the first week. Uh, do you like playing charades? How do you like trying playing charades when your wife's asking for something? You can't figure out what she's saying. <laughs> Pick up everything in the room, point at all kinds of stuff. No, 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 no. Oh, that, okay. Uh, so each day we just said, Lord, give us grace. Give us the strength we need to carry on. And God will give grace. We can rest in Him. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I read it rather straight through on purpose. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We basically spent three days there. No guarantee. Just hanging on to God. Entirely out of our hands. You know, we want to fix things. I'm a fixer. I've learned with my wife that sometimes she doesn't want me to fix it. She just wants me to listen. I've come to the point that I now ask her, do you want me to fix that or you just want yeah, just listen to me? Let me, let me in it. That's okay. To me, that's not fixing it, but that fix it for hun? Fine, bring it on. Uh, death can cast a frightening shadow over our lives because we're in situations that are totally helpless. But guess what? The good shepherd's there. He's able. He's the only one who walks through the dark valleys. When all else is gone in the middle of the night or the middle of the day, God is there. He is my shepherd. Verses 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. good friend of mine, uh, his girlfriend, uh, wrote that verse down and gave it to him. Her name was Shirley. Verses 5 and 6, in the ancient culture, in the Near Eastern culture, it was customary to anoint a person's feet with fragrant oil. The host was also expected to protect their guests at all cost. In these verses, we see God pregnant is even when we are surrounded by enemies. For I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How big is your God? Is He big enough when the biggest storm of life drops down on your head? The fact is, He is. The question is, are we trusting Him? Are we resting? It's hard. It's awful hard. But God is in control. Even when I don't see it when I don't understand it. He's able to see us through the trials and the troubles. He will guide us. He will protect us through life. And then in the end, bring us home to his house. The Lord is my shepherd. If you want to take a hymn book, and I want you to open the page, I believe it's 44. Great is thy faithfulness. You all know it. You probably wouldn't even need to look at it. But it just, uh, 
the author here, he really understands the Lord is our shepherd. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Not fathers of our day that are derelict, or, but fathers of our day that are trusting, caring, providing. There's no shadow of turning with him. He does not change. His compassion doesn't fail. As he has been, thou forever will be. Summer, winter, springtime, and harvest. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. I'm amazed at how the sun goes up and the sun goes down, the moon comes up, the moon goes down, the seasons come. They join in all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Here might be the biggest blessing here. Pardon for sin and a peace that endures. Your own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed you have provided. Great are you in your faithful God. I want to close it with two, two verses of the book of Ephesians. A couple of my favorite verses. Verses 20 and 21. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. According to the powers that work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we're amazed at your love. We're amazed at your grace. We're amazed at your mercy. We just so thank you for all your goodness to us. I thank you for sparing my wife. I thank you, Father, for giving us more days to walk together and to walk with you. I pray, Lord God, that you, by your spirit and your power, would be glorified in all of our hearts and lives. Thank you, Father, for Pastor Daniel and this congregation. God bless them. Help them to trust you. Help them to rest in you. Help them to continue to be about the master's business, reaching others with their saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your mercy extended to us. We thank you and praise you again for your goodness and your faithfulness. May you be praised, for we pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.